My name is Michael. My wife and I just led us into worship. We have the privilege of being the campus pastors right here at the East Raleigh campus. However, that does not mean that we love our Apex nor our online campus any less. Apex, we love you. I think, honestly, that you have the best campus pastors in the entire world at our Apex campus. So, um, very jealous of you. I love you, Lee and Ashley. And I think that uh, we also have the greatest lead pastors in the entire world, Pastor Mike and Ashton. They are away right now. Uh, he is preaching for a pastor's conference in Iowa. Iowa. And so it's just encouraging to know that there are other churches being built up through the gifts and the talents of what God has built up here. And I'm encouraged by that. And I want to honor you, Pastor Mike and Ashton. And thank you for the opportunity to preach. Today is party with the pastor. Come on, one more time. Party with the pastor. It's your first step. If you've never been to a party with the pastor, party with the pastor is for you. You might have been coming for three minutes or 30 years. And if you've never come to party with the pastor after the service, head right back there. We got a team back there. Free food. Hear the story of the church. It's only about 15, 20 minutes long. And we're starting a new sermon series today titled House of Miracles. Why don't you say that? House of Miracles. And the most um, uh, appropriate passage of scripture to preach at the beginning of a sermon series called House of Miracles comes to us from John chapter 2. Why don't you flip there in your Bibles real quick. John chapter 2 is where we're going to be. I encourage you to come every single week during this series. Next week is Mother's Day, so bring your mom. Bringyourmom.com. I think that's a thing. Uh, bring your mom to Mother's Day. We're going to continue House of Miracles after that. When you study the miracles of Jesus and the miracles of God, it builds your faith. And if we need anything in this day and age, it's the building of our faith. What I'm trying to tell you is don't miss church. Look to your neighbor and say, that was for you. John chapter 2. Let's read together. It's on the screen. It says this. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Someone say, no more wine. Mm -hmm. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. Verse 5, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. That's important. You can highlight that if you want to. Verse number six. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. That's a lot of wine. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out. Take it to the master of the ceremonies. So the servants followed the instructions. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, Though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine. Someone say, the best wine. The best wine. First. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so we'll pray for you. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana and Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Verse 12, after the wedding, he went to Capernaum, did a little vacation for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Let's pray. Jesus, stir it up like you've never stirred it up in our hearts. Do what only you can do in each one of us, I pray. Fill us up. Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, John. I like to party. <laughs> I really, I like to party. I like to dance. Some of y'all, if you saw me on the dance floor, you'd be like, I don't know, that is not, not my pastor, okay? I like to dance. I like to have fun. I like to party. I'm getting a little bit older. Not older, but I'm turning 30 this year. Come on, say happy birthday to me. I'm turning 30. 30. This year, the older I get, I will say, the older I get, the more I enjoy, like, bed by 8 o'clock. That's my new party, okay? Watching Marvel movies with my wife, 8 o'clock, that's our party. But, you know, I like weddings. I like to party. Eighth grade year, 
It's the last day of junior high, last day of eighth grade year, and they decided to, the administration decided that all of the last day of eighth grade year would be a party. Everyone say party. Party. So what happened was that the classroom was divided. Each classroom only had 20 minutes uh, worth of time so that you could, it was basically just a half day where you could spend 20 minutes in each classroom. You could say goodbye to your friends. You know, you could write in their notebooks, stay cool. Y'all remember, stay cool. And look at you now, you know. <laughs> okay, stay cool. You could write that down. You weren't really exchanging phone numbers at the time. Maybe like two kids in my entire junior high had phones, but you're writing things down. You're giving hugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's fourth period. It's the class right before lunch, which was my favorite class, <laughs> right before lunch, and the class is about to be dismissed. There's like one minute on the bell. Everyone in the classroom, they're starting to gather their binders, their backpacks, their pencils, stay cool, all of these things. My friends, Kelsey and Alfredo, like the pasta, Kelsey and Alfredo, they, they come to me, because I'm in a corner, I've got zero friends, <laughs> praise God, eighth grade was not good. Anyway, they come to me, and they say, Michael, would you take a picture of us? And I was like, with you? They're like, no, of us. And I was like, okay, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, Jill. And so they, they proceeded to hand me something called a disposable camera. If you don't know what that is, it's a little camera, it's made of plastic, and what you have to do, there's this knob in the back. You have to wind it for like three and a half hours in order to take a picture. And when you take the picture, you don't actually know what you took until you go to Walgreens a week later. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. They actually throw away the camera. They, they get out the film, which we don't, unfortunately, have time to go into. But they get this little thing called film. They develop it. It's a crazy ordeal. I'm glad they're gone. Anyway, that's a disposable camera. So Kelsey hands me the disposable camera. And she and Alfredo go over there. I'm about to take this picture. This is a 100% true story. <laughs> I'm about to take this picture. And right as I'm about to take the picture, the bell rings. Everyone starts leaving for lunch. The, class, the, the hallways are getting loud. People are wrapping up their binders. One last hug to their boyfriend that they're going to get rid of in a week. All of these things. I'm going to take the picture... And out of nowhere, a fellow classmate, his name was Chase. I think his name probably still is Chase. Uh, Chase, that joke just never gets old. It's so funny. You can use it. It's awesome. So Chase, he, he runs from the other side of the class as I'm taking the picture. And he kicks me right in the chickadees, okay? Okay. He kicks my gumdrops. I fall to the floor, incapacitated. I mean, he kicked my blueberries so hard, Elliot felt it, okay? My son, yet to be born of 10 years. He kicked my blueberries so hard that I went through puberty, boom, like that, in one fell swoop. I mean, it's just, he kicked me so hard. I fall to the ground. It's a true story. Fall to the ground. I can't get up. I'm trying to get up to, to Will Smith slap him, you know? You got that one, Gigi? You like that one? That was funny. That was for you. So I'm trying to get up. And, and, and I'm trying to get up, and, 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 and I can't get up. I'm just, I'm just down and out. The nurse has to come in from the hallway with a wheelchair. I know. I know. It was, it was the most pain I've ever felt in my entire life. I will have you know, we serve a God who's a healer, amen? amen? And I got two kids, so everything is good down there. It's all healed. Praise God for the miracle. Okay, you don't have to worry about nothing. Anyway, isn't life like that sometimes? I mean, things could be going so good. You're on cloud nine. It's the last day of junior high. Life is a party. The job is stable, the kids are healthy, the marriage is full, and the diagnosis hits. There's a death in the family. You find out she's cheating on you. And it's like you're up here, and everything is going so well, and then in one moment, just one moment, 
you're at rock bottom. What do you do when the wine runs out? When everything that you can produce on your own is gone. It's empty. There's nothing that you can do. The cards have been dealt. You were up here on cloud nine. Everything was good. You get the news. You suddenly hit rock bottom. What do you do when the wine runs out? Let's recap John chapter two. Y'all still with me? Recapping John chapter two. Jesus and his disciples, they're at a party. Jesus, like me, I tend to think that to he was a party animal. I think that Jesus liked to get down. I think that he may have even invented the cha-cha slide. <laughs> That's in First Imaginations 1-1, okay? <laughs> Jesus and his disciples, they're at a party. Everything seems to be going good. All of a sudden, the wine runs out. Jesus' mother comes to Jesus and says, the wine is gone. Now, to some of you, that would be a big deal, but we have to understand what that meant contextually and culturally in that time frame and that location it wouldn't be like it wouldn't be like if the cheese ran out at the wedding or the cookies ran out at the wedding it's a much larger deal than that right. upon studying commentators would say that the jewish a jewish wedding ceremony was the biggest party all year long it was the most extravagant celebration. It was uh, highly valued. It was a chance for friends and family to come together, celebrate the union of, of a man and a woman. It was a huge ordeal. It was the biggest party ever. And when the wine ran out, if the wine would run out, commentators would say that it was disgraceful, dishonorable, and maybe even detestable. You see, they would say that when the wine, if the wine would run out, that that reputation would carry with you perhaps all of your life. That you would be known for the person or couple that did not supply enough. On another level, Jewish rabbis viewed wine as a symbol of joy. Some of you, when I say that, had no idea how much in common you had with a Jewish rabbi, okay? <laughs> Especially at our Apex campus. If that's you, I will pray for you after the service. And so they run out of wine. It's a really, check this out, it's a really, really big deal. All of a sudden, Mary comes to Jesus almost very urgently. Almost, when you read the text, it's like a little bit maybe frantic. And I'm wondering if maybe she knew the couple really, really well. Maybe when she found out there was no more wine in the building, maybe she thought this couple's reputation is on the line. I need to fix the problem. I'm going to go to Jesus. So she goes to Jesus, and she says, the wine is gone. And Jesus responds to her, and it seems rude, but I'll explain it. He says, woman, what concern is that to us? Now, here in America, in English, if you're to call someone, like, say, woman, it can be viewed as definitely rude. Bear in mind that John was written in Greek, and so when, you, when you're to translate Jesus' response to Mary from Greek to English, woman is the best translation. Probably, if you were to just translate word for word, it would be lady, and so it was like really Jesus saying, hey, lady, but you wouldn't say lady, so grammatically they, anyway, Jesus wasn't being rude. In fact, he was intentional about distinguishing the now relationship between him and Mary. Because when he addressed her as woman and not mother, he was indicating that he's moving from sonship to public savior. So he says, woman, my time has not yet come. And then something interesting happens. Then the very next line, I don't know if you caught this. He says, my time has not yet come. The very next line, Mary goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. I don't know if there was like some nonverbal communication between Jesus and Mary between the time when he said, 
that's not, that's not my concern. And then she goes to the servants. I don't know if she gave him the look, like, you better turn this water into wine, you know? You did it for me on a Saturday when Joseph had a really stressful day, okay? I looked down, I had some water. It turned, no, th this is the first miracle. There's only a few. That was a joke. But anyway, I don't know if she gave him the look. I don't know what she did. But either way, she knew that the miracle was on the way. And then what happens is the servants fill the jars with water. Everybody say water. When Jesus comes in, he turns the water to wine. Everybody say wine. Master of the ceremonies comes. He sips the wine. And he says, what does he say? He says, you've saved the best for last. In American Christianity... Modern day Christianity, we tend to believe in reference to miracles that they most often occur in seasons and states of complete and utter emptiness. A lot of times we live under this impression that in order for God to perform his greatest work, I have to be at the lowest I've ever been. In order for God to save my son, he's got to hit rock bottom. In order for God to save my marriage, it's got to be at an absolute failure. It's got to be so low. Oh God, I'm waiting till you bring me to the lowest of lows so that you can raise me up on the mountaintops. We believe, we tend to believe that God performs miracles when we're on empty. John chapter 2 teaches us the exact opposite. Jesus didn't take empty jars and fill them with wine. Wow. 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 Jesus had you fill the jars with water right. and then took the full jars right. Right. and transformed them into something more beautiful. I think miracles come more often when you and I are full as opposed wow. to when we're empty. Come on. Come on. I wonder if that's why the disciples were able to perform so many miracles is because when you're in the, in the presence of God, when, the, when you're in relationship with Jesus, when you're full, that's when the overflow happens. It's not when you're empty. And I will say that God is so gracious and so just. He's so much more gracious, gracious than I am that he will reach down in the middle of your emptiness and provide a miracle. But that doesn't mean that we should seek out emptiness. You, you hear what I'm trying to say? You need to seek out fullness. It's the fullness of the relationship that Mary had with Jesus to know that the miracle was on the way before there was any indication of it. Somehow Mary knew Jesus is about to come through, but there was no sign it was about to happen. She knew the character of God enough to know he won't let this fail. My God, my God. Do you have a relationship with the Lord? I mean, do you have a full relationship with the Lord? A lot of times as Christians, let's just be honest, first of all, we don't or we don't know how. Right. We don't or we don't know how. Maybe you've never been taught. This is your opportunity. Maybe you've been taught and there'll be some conviction. Conviction is a good thing. We should embrace it. How do you get full? How do you have this relationship with the Lord? Now, I want to talk about that today. If you're still with me, say yeah. How do you have a relationship with the Lord? Three points, and they're so easy. They're so stinking easy. Here's the first one. You ready? Read your Bible. Hmm. Heard some laughter. Read the Bible. The Bible says that it is our daily bread. Everyone say daily. It's our daily bread. Now, Jesus wasn't being hypothetical or theoretical when he said daily. He was being literal. He was saying, this is something that you're supposed to consume every day. In fact, Joshua 1.8, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, says, read this book of instruction morning and evening. Then you'll be able to obey it. And you'll become successful in all you do. It's saying, Joshua, the Lord is saying to Joshua, read it morning and evening. Psalm chapter 1 says he meditates on the law day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, 
which yield its fruit in season, whose leaves do not wither. Why? Because he meditates day and night. Now, in today's society, and I'm not trying to, maybe you've never been taught this. This is your opportunity. But we have been self-diagnosed with self-imposed spiritual anorexia. We're so starving spiritually because we're not reading, we're not consuming the daily bread, and so Monday, Tuesday comes around, we're famished. We're starving. The devil offers a little bit of bread, and we take it at first glance. And you wonder why you're so weak and can't resist temptation. It's because you're famished. It's because you're spiritually weak. It's because you don't, you don't read the Bible. I know it's hard. But the reason why you cannot resist the devil and the reason why you cannot resist temptation and the reason why at the first chance of gossip, at the first chance of lust, at the first chance of division, you take it every single time is because you're hungry. That's why after church on Sunday, I make bad food decisions. I don't go for the egg whites on Sunday after church. I go for the chocolate mousse cake in my refrigerator because I'm hungry. You make bad decisions when you're hungry. Now, I want to ask another question, unfood related. If I want to have a healthy relationship with my wife, how often should I talk to her? Three times a week. <laughs> Daily, right? Every single day. Can we agree with that? If you want to have a healthy relationship with your spouse, with, I mean, if you just want to have a healthy relationship with your friend, you know, especially your spouse daily, okay? We can all agree with that. Say yes if you agree. Yes. If I want to be intimate with my wife, <laughs> how often should I talk to her? All day, every day, doing the dishes, taking her out to dinner, buying her chocolates, all of the things. I should be in constant communication with her, right? Am I right? Ladies, am I right? She's like, yeah, yeah, you better. Get them. <laughs> Intimacy in the bedroom happens in the kitchen first, but that's another, that's another story. That's another, that's another sermon for next week. I'm still learning that, right? <laughs> I'm still like, I'm preaching to myself on this one. Imagine for a moment that on our wedding night, I consummated the marriage with my wife. And then after the consummation was over, I left for seven days without talking to her, without texting her, without calling her. Then I find her again seven days later and expect intimacy again. How many of y'all know I ain't getting nothing? <laughs> but we do it with God. We accept God. We invite the Lord to dwell within us. It's a very intimate consummation in a relationship with the Lord. We leave, we come back seven days later, starving, broken, and beating, and saying, God, would you perform an intimate miracle? Wow. And God's like, who are you? I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just trying to teach you this is what modern-day Christianity for many people has turned into. It's an experience on a Sunday morning. It's a good vibes. It's a good feeling. But... You're serving two masters, and you wonder why you're starving throughout the week. You keep looking for intimacy with the Father, and he's like, man, I got two or three things to show you in the book. You'd probably get a lot more from this than you maybe would get at the altar sometimes. So why do we read the Bible? Because God speaks to us. It's our daily bread. Here's a tip. This is a pro tip. Some of y'all like pro tips, okay? This is a really good tip. When it comes to reading the Bible, a lot of times we don't know how. 
It's like you flip open the Bible, you go to Song of Solomon, you're, you're weirded out, and you're like, okay, that did not work. <laughs> flip to Leviticus, you're confused, you're like, okay, this is not what Pastor Michael was talking about. I don't know what's going on. So I want you to start in John. If you're not reading right now, I want you to start in John. You're already one chapter ahead, okay? You're welcome. And uh, here's what I want you to do. Tonight, when you start reading the Bible, I want you to crack it open, dust it off, and I want you to read until God speaks to you. That's it. That's it. I just want you to read until God speaks to you. He'll speak to you every single time. Every single time. What will happen is you'll be reading and he'll like highlight something in your spirit as you read. For me, sometimes it's like within the first chapter. I can remember distinctly one time I cracked open my Bible, the first verse I read, I was like, whew, that would hurt, Lord. Like, that's what you're trying to teach me. And what you do when God speaks to you, stop reading and let God speak to you. And maybe reread the line. Maybe reread, okay, reread, reread the verse. Say, okay, Lord, what are you trying to show me? Because if you're on this, I got to read three chapters a day. Maybe God wants to speak to you in chapter two, but you read right over it. Wow. Right. Wow. Wow. And it's not a checkbox. Right. It's a, I'm just going to read until God fills me up with his, with the daily dosage of what I'm supposed to consume on that day. For, for sometimes it's one, I get it on the first verse. God speaks to me in the first verse. Sometimes it's the 10th chapter. Sometimes I think my, my heart is hard and I have to consume a lot more food until God can finally speak to me. So you just read until he speaks. Y'all with me? Say yeah. Yes. Number two. This is so easy. Ready for this? Number two. Pray. Pray. Point number one is read the Bible. You want to be full? You want to have a relationship with God? Point number two. Uh, one is read the Bible. Point number two is Pray. Now, everyone in here, if I took a consensus, if I took a vote, and I said, how many of you believe that prayer is effective? I'm pretty sure 99% of us would raise our hands. How many of you believe that we should be praying? Again, I'm thinking majority, 100%. I think we all know that we should pray. A lot of us just don't know how to pray. So let me just say this. Why do we pray? It's a chance for us to talk to God. This is a two-way conversation. This is a relationship. I'm trying to break religion off your life in Jesus' name. I'm trying to help you step into a relationship with God. A relationship requires two-way communication. Stop being religious. It'll get you nowhere. Read the Bible. Let God speak. Respond to him in prayer. And the problem is, and this is not on you, a lot of times we just don't know what to pray. So we're like, okay, I know that I need to pray. Pastor Carlos said I need to pray. Close my door, go into my closet. I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you for the food. And, um, you know, Lord, just whatever, just do it, Lord. And in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You know, we just don't know what to pray. So I want to help you out. What you're going to do is you have a, if you're taking notes on a blank piece of paper, I know I see a lot, uh, a lot of you. What you're going to do is you're going to write down um, a vertical line down the center of your paper, and then a horizontal line down the center of your paper. So you're going to divide a piece of paper into quadrants. If you're taking notes on a phone, there's just four sections that I want to help you out. I use this in my personal prayer life. I've used it for as long as I can remember. I still use it to this day. The first section, the way you start off, is with praise. Everyone say praise. praise. Here's what you're going to do. Under the praise section... You're just going to write down five or six things that you're grateful for. For me, it always starts with Jesus. Every single morning or evening when I have the time to pray, I'm like, Jesus, man, thank you for dying for me. Thank you so much. You didn't have to. I didn't deserve it. Thank you so much that you are my God. Thank you so much for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. It's not a checkbox. I'm, I'm talking to God. I'm, I'm thanking God. Jesus, you didn't have to die for me. Thank you for doing it. I'm grateful every day. Next is my wife. Always number two. Jesus, thank you for my wife. She's a gift from you to me. She's full of beauty inside and outside. She's full of grace. Thank God she's still with me because y'all know I have messed up a lot. Thank God that she's still with me. Thank you, Lord, that we woke up this morning and she told me that she loved me and we were able to, like, all of these things. Thank God for my wife. Thank you, God, for my kids. I know I almost threw them out the window yesterday, but I'm thankful for them today. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for my offspring. It's a blessing from you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for my job. I know it sucks right now, but I'm, I'm grateful that I have uh, uh, the ability to have food on the table. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my church. We are part of such a blessed church. Thank you for my church. There are a lot of people that wish they were in driving distance of a church like this. And sometimes we miss on a Sunday morning, but that, that's a different sermon. Thank you, Lord, for my church. Thank you, God, for my church. Uh, section number two is this, plead, plead. Section number one, pray. Section number two, plead. Plead is a chance for you to tell the Lord all of your shortcomings. So for me, it's like when I get to this section, I'm like, Lord, I messed up yesterday. I said that thing that I wasn't supposed to say. I had that thought, I, that gossip, I shouldn't have said that, or that thing that I did, or whatever, how I responded in that moment, how I treated my kids, yada, 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 fill in the blank. And you just list off every single area of your life where you're like, Lord, I've fallen short. I'm sorry. Here's the thing. God already knows where you fell short. Okay, he already knows. But what it does for your spirit is it's a, it's a reminder of how much grace has already been extended to you each and every day. And and I'm not in the business of hiding anything from God. He knows everything already. And so it's my opportunity to come clean and say, these are, the, these are my shortcomings. Help me, Father, not to do these things again. Number three is people. If you're still, if you're still with me, the third one is people. At any given moment, there are probably 10 to 12 people on my people list. And um, the way that I often decide who's on my people list is I look for people in pain. I look for people in pain. So if I see something on social media, I'm like, man, this person is going through it. If I get a text message, pastor, pray for me. I'm just going to write your name. There are many of you in this room I've prayed for dozens of times. And I will keep praying for you until you see the miracle. But you're on my prayer list. And I want, I want everyone in here to have a prayer list. Ten people on their prayer list. Who am I praying for every single day? It might be a short prayer. God, this person doesn't know you yet. Father, reveal yourself to them. This person is struggling. They're sick in their body. Father, would you touch their body? This person's marriage is broken. I just pray that you put your, your hand of healing on their marriage. You just pray for people. And then the last one is this petition. They all start with P's. Do you like the alliteration? I didn't get it last service. I said ask, and then like 30,000 people texted me, hey, it should be petition. And so there you go. <laughs> the last one is petition. Petition is a chance for you to ask God for whatever you want. That's okay. When my son Elliot asks me for things, I love being able to fulfill his requests. It's okay to come to God and ask for things. God, renew my mind. Father, this job stinks. Get me out. Father, my marriage is broken. Can you please restore it? Here's what happens a lot of the time for me personally. I go through praise. I'm grateful. I go through plead. I'm thankful. I go through people. I'm praying about people in much worse situations than myself. By the time I get to petition, a lot of the times, if I'm being honest, I'm like, you've already done so much. There's really just thanks again. I don't, the things that I thought that I needed, you've already done. So what? Lord, thank you for being my, and I, sometimes I just go back to praise. But it's a helpful, is this helpful for you? It's, a, it's an exercise. It's an exercise that, that will help you in your prayer life. You'll pray for 30 minutes, no problem. No problem. It'll fly by. Next one is this. Last one is this. How to have a relationship with God. How to get full. How to stay full. Worship team, you can come. Is worship. It's so simple. Pray. I'm sorry. Read. Because God speaks. Pray because you can speak back. And then worship is when the working happens. Worship is a lot of times where the transformation occurs. I want to read this uh, Romans 12, starting in verse 1. Why don't we read it 
Why don't you follow along when I read it? And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We're going to respond in worship in just a moment. I want to tell you a story. Is that okay? Y'all like stories? I may have told this one a while ago, but I know that I didn't tell it to our Apex campus. I know there's a lot of people that have joined the church recently. And in fourth grade, I am, I, I love the Lord. Uh, got curly hair. I'm extremely good looking fourth grader, okay? Really, really good looking. Just kidding. Um, in fourth grade, we live in Nebraska. A lot of corn, a lot of cows, not much going on. My dad is in charge of the youth ministry for the Assemblies of God in the state of Nebraska. And so uh, at, in the summer times, we'd have youth camps all summer long. And as a kid, I would just like live at camp. I just lived there. It was awesome. And uh, I think it was fourth or fifth grade. It like comes my week to be a camper. So I'm in summer camp and uh, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a night, an evening service. The preacher comes. I don't remember what he preached. I'm sure he preached a great message. Anyway, I'm responding. Four or 500 teenagers are responding, or fourth graders, are responding to the message in worship. So if this was the Nebraska altar, I'd like be right over there. That was my worship spot. And I came in to worship with zero expectations, but complete surrender. So much of worship is about letting go control. Reason why you might have hard worshiping, hard time worshiping, is because you're still in control. You don't ever let go. You don't ever just let God take over. Forget what the person on the left or right of you is thinking. Who cares? You're in the presence of God. And you just let go of control. And you say, okay, Lord, my heart is on the table. That's what worship is. So I'm in fourth grade. I'm lifting my hands, releasing control. And I I had a, a vision. It was like, I say my mind's eye, but it's like the Lord giving me a vision in my mind, right? Y'all with me? It wasn't like I saw something in the auditorium. It was like I'm closing my eyes and the Lord put a picture in my mind, okay? Does that make sense? So I'm worshiping and I see the Lord. It's one of the most memorable moments of my life. I see the Lord. He's got, he's got two hands, one like this, one like this. In one of his hands, He's holding something. He gets closer, and I can identify he's holding a heart. And the other hand, he reaches into my chest, fourth grade, pulls out my current heart, and exchanges it for a new one. I didn't ask for that. I didn't come to the altar and say, God, exchange my heart. But God's a father. And when you open yourself up, he knows what you need. I didn't know that I needed the exchange, but he did. So you come into worship, you release control, and you let God do whatever he wants to do. And he transforms you from the inside out. I'll say one last thing. And then we're going to respond in a moment of worship. I think that's appropriate. 
a chance for you to exercise, a chance for you to surrender. This is why a lot of times we lift our hands because it's a sign of surrender. It's saying control is not in my hands anymore. There's a biblical step towards surrender and worship. Some of y'all might start here holding the TV, right? Get yourself to touchdown, right? No, it, just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're just surrendering your hands. That's it. You're just surrendering your hands, however way you want to. At this point in my life, coming up on 30 years old, it's taken me 30 years to learn this message that I just preached in 30 minutes. I'm not really even that concerned about the wine anymore, if I'm honest. I'm just full. <laughs> I'm just, I love the relationship. I don't, my relationship with Jesus is not based on the miracle anymore. It's not based on what he can do for me. It's based on who he is to me. It's the relationship that I value. The miracle is just a surplus. If the miracle comes, great. If it doesn't come, great. Because I got the relationship. I got the water. I'm full. Why don't you stand to your feet? Spirit, fall fresh. Would you lift your hands? I want you for the next 60 seconds to open your mouth and begin to thank God for everything he's done in your life. I want you to speak loud enough so that your own ear can hear you speak. I want you to lift your hands and for the next few moments, you just take a moment and you just say, Lord, I'm so grateful. How did I get here, Father? The things that you've done, fill me up, Lord. Fill me up. I'm not even chasing wine. I'm just chasing fullness, Father. Fill me up. Draw me close to you. Come on, lift your hands. Let's worship.